uh, from COVID-19 here in Brazil because the Minister of Health decided not to deliver and not to publicize the information they were like they were uh, releasing. And so they changed the time they're releasing and also the, the amount of data and the data they were releasing. So journalists got together and they're doing uh, as a coalition, as a consortium, uh, all competitors, you know, working together to to bring to Brazilian society the data uh, from COVID-19 to understand the broader aspect of what we're living right now. So I think uh, at the same time that we have, uh, back to your point, extreme measures from the government to attack journalists. Um, I, uh, what I see is journalists, you know, uh, building resilience and that it's super important for journalism and, civ and civic space in Brazil. Mar Marcelo, based on some of the things that uh, Lana mentioned, uh, I want to ask you about Lava Jato. You're a member of the Lava Jato Task Force. Lava Jato has been a huge uh, story for the Brazilian media and a story that has been going on for more than five years, right? What is the future of Lava Jato in, our, in your view in terms of investigations? Are, is it going to end at some point or because we're seeing ramifications, right? Very different Lava Jatos actually in places like Rio, Curitiba, Brasilia. Can you give us kind of a summary of what's going on and your views on, on Lava Jato in 2020? Roberto, I think if we know, if I knew that uh, <laughs> what's going to happen with Lava Jato would be a million dollar question. Uh, in fact, uh, if uh, Lava Jato had to, to end today uh, with no further uh, uh, investigation steps, only processing the information we, we, we already have, we would have at least more two years of new cases. Without making any other searches, any other uh, inter, uh, telephonic interception, telematic interception, we would have uh, at least two more years. We have uh, 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 so many materials, so many materials to 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 work with. But uh, task force, uh, uh, in its definition, it's something uh, temporary. We could not uh, last forever, and I think we. Can uh, uh, think uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a short view uh, the end of, of the case, and that perspective that you you mentioned that we have uh, some lava jatos in in other states, it's a uh, it's a, a symptom of what I'm I'm saying. In fact, we are trying to reproduce the way we worked here in Curitiba to other other states and to share when it's possible, the evidence we gather. In fact, uh, we have uh, many uh, many cases to, to work with. And I can precise when it's going to end and how it's going to end. In fact, uh, the, the most important thing for, for us is to keep the legacy and uh, regarding the investigative, investigative tools, the coordination with other uh, uh, key partners like CGU, like the federal police, I think uh, Lava Jato uh, create a, an environment that we can work closer than we did before. And uh, I don't, I don't know when Lava Jato went, but uh, if our uh, procedure keeps, I think it it works. Give, let let me bring you to the conversation here, and and basically you've been working in Brazil for a long time in in compliance and investigations. And Lava Jato has been transformative to, to, to the business sector as well, right? So what is your view, also based on the things that we, we've seen in the index and, you know, the fact that Brazil is in a better position uh, in, in several uh, aspects than other countries. But moving forward, uh, how do you see the evolution of, of uh, compliance and investigations with this new phase of I won't use the word post Lava Jato based on what Marcelo just said, but a new Lava Jato and more fragmented Lava Jato. Yeah, so I, I, um, I think it's interesting when we look at the report we wrote last year, um, and you know, even we as authors forget what we write. Uh, but it's interesting we go back and take a look, and we highlighted, as a matter of fact, four things to look out for from Brazil. Right, the things to watch, and we have that in this year's 
report as well. And the four things we looked at were, as Marcelo mentioned, the possibility that there will be a general prosecutor um, nominated outside the shortlist. Um, we looked at the Supreme Court decision around um, whether defendants um, sentenced in appeal can continue to um, seek legal remedies outside of prison. Um, we looked at uh, the anti-corruption package, which was sent through, uh, or which is going to be sent through Congress. And um, we also looked at where Alana mentioned, uh, transparency challenges. Um, and uh, I think the first thing that needs to be mentioned is that on all four fronts, there have been negative developments, which is quite concerning. And that I think is overall captured in Brazil's drop. On the other hand, um, I think it's important to state as well uh, that the legacy of, of Lava Jato and, and other investigations, but certainly um, the uh, what we've seen here uh, in in Brazil, you know, when we compare Brazil to other countries, Brazil is still far ahead in terms of its capacity to combat corruption in in many respects. Whether, as Marcel mentioned, the use of collaboration agreements, although they have uh, obviously been affected by this most recent law that's been implemented, um, the level and quality of international enforcement, I think Brazil ex uh, exceeds there, and, and certainly. Um, you know, Peru is another country where we're seeing quite a lot of cooperation with Brazil, but also outside um, uh, uh, outside Latin America. So, um, you know, in the case of Brazil, I know Switzerland and, and the United States, very important ties have been forged there on the enforcement front. And when we look, on the other hand, at the, uh, 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 at the corporate environment, we have seen that companies have responded. Unfortunately, in most cases, companies respond. Obviously, one thing is to, to have... Uh, deeply ingrained values of ethics and transparency as part of corporate values. That's a good thing. That's a minimum requirement. The other thing is noticing that your environment is changing, that there is actually an end to impunity, um, which is one of the big issues that we've faced across Latin America and certainly in Brazil. And then the balance and the calculus for companies starts changing. So companies in earnest as of around 2014, 2015, started implementing compliance programs. So the expertise and the maturity of those programs now, I would also say is quite far ahead, uh, certainly compared to the rest of Latin America, it's very much in, in development. Um, the concern, of course, is if there is a slowdown enforcement, either because of the capacity or the lack of political will to enforce whichever one uh, happens, and they're obviously interrelated, over time, there may be some level of erosion of uh, companies looking to invest in, um, you know, bolstering compliance. So uh, conducting, uh, you know, their own internal investigations, um, making sure that they're dealing with, you know, uh, reputable third parties, um, making sure that, uh, you know, they have proper training so that their individuals or their team team members know what to be out on the lookout for, um, knowing what to ask of suppliers and 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 other vendors, you know, uh, making it very clear what kind of behavior they expect if they want to do business with the, with the companies. Uh, but there's been a very significant progress on that front in the private sphere, uh, and you know, the jury's out now to see whether that will continue. If we do indeed see some form of diminishing capacity uh, in Brazil on a sustained level, we've only touched on and we only highlighted the possibility that that's starting to happen. Um, obviously, next year's index, I think, will be telling. So also uh, an area that deeply affects the, the private sector, and I want to hear Marcelo's opinion. You mentioned uh, COAFI. The Brazilian intelligence, uh, intelligence Unit for Financial Crimes. Um, of course, we saw since the beginning of the Bolsonaro administration a lot of a, a political dis dispute around Coafi. First, the idea to put the agency under the Ministry of Justice, then Congress vetoed that, and then there were discussions about reforming the board of Coafi. It's and at the end, we now have a settlement. They wanted to change the name of Coafi for. <laughs> or a financial intelligence unit. Now we have the COAFI under the central bank uh, with some changes to its board uh, and some question marks regarding, you know, what will happen next. And we, COAFI has been really described as a success case in Brazil's fight against corruption, Marcelo. And I know you work a lot with, you know, with uh, financial intelligence and all the major anti-corruption uh, investigation in Brazil started with financial intelligence, right? 
Are you optimistic about what's going on with Coafi? How do you think uh, a the AML space will change uh, with, with the, this new Coafi? Roberto, uh, at, uh, despite of all those uh, those discussions that we had last year, uh, the ongoing work uh, uh, from Coaf uh, is still is still very good for us. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, FIUs in general and, and Coaf in particular particular are uh, one of the best sources we have to to get uh, our red flags regarding uh, some uh, corruption schemes. And uh, I'm very confident that it, it, it will work. It, it will work uh, this year. Uh, we have some uh, outputs from Coaf so far, and uh, I think things are working. Uh, I'm very optimistic that uh, uh, that that, uh, that issues we had last year, uh, in the end of the day, gave more strength to to, to Coaf. And uh, for me, the perspective that Coaf must have uh, uh, for, uh, from the uh, to the future is to uh, uh, get more closer to the other FIUs, to uh, uh, get uh, when it's possible, of course, uh, get, to give more uh, um, more transparency of uh, of its work, uh, to make the the social uh, the civil society uh, uh, perceive the, perceive the importance that the Coaf uh, Coaf has. And uh, one challenge, of course, I think it, 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 it does not fit to work at, at this moment in our conversation, but uh, to deal with one uh, future issue that uh, all FIOs will have to, to deal with is that uh, how FIOs will work with uh, the cryptocurrency issue. Uh, in fact, it's not a, a, a currency, so uh, uh, at first we don't uh, work with the bank system. But it, it uh, uh, it's a, a real issue, and we have to know. And Coaf is a key player in that that issue. Mm -hmm. Can and, I can I just quickly ask a follow up question there, um, Roberto, uh, regarding uh, the information exchange? So uh, interesting your um, comment, Marcelo. I think about. Uh, Coafi and it's moving from Minister of Justice to uh, the central bank. And there were a lot of concerns flagged at the time. So it's encouraging to hear that that hasn't really had a negative impact on um, on uh, investigations. How about the relationship with the tax authorities? Because there are also, and the information exchange with tax authorities, because there are also some issues in the past and, and potential interference, which made alarm bells ring. So I'd be interested to hear how that's uh, moving. Well, uh, just uh, first, uh, I'd like to talk about the, the ruling of the Supreme Court. When uh, uh, the Supreme Court decided the, the, the question regarding COAF, they all also uh, uh, made uh, 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 a, a very important comment that uh, the tax authority could uh, uh, share uh, those uh, information with us. Uh, and that, that movement was very important, and uh, the tax authority is another uh, 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 very important player we have. When we make the, the, the analysis of the the, the evolution of, of the, the the assets that some some uh, uh, people that uh, that uh, are under investigation, uh, it's very important to to have the, the, that that uh, that support from uh, the tax authority. And uh, of course, we we are working very in a very uh, cautious way. Uh, maybe the the the, the ruling. From the Supreme Court uh, um, could allow us to go in a, a more aggressive way, but since in Brazil we have no such stability in the, in the, in the rulings, we work uh, in a more conservative way. Always we request to the judge to get an, an order to to make this first contact with the tax authority. So they are very important, but we are very cautious in order to get this this contact with them. Let, let me, we, we're going to open to Q&A uh, very shortly. So I, I see we already have a few questions for those who are on WebEx. You can send your questions to the Q&A moderator using the chat box on the right side of your screen. 
for those of us of you following us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, you can use uh, the hashtag CCC index or tag us directly. Um, let's discuss a little bit what changes with COVID-19, right? And I think it's a, we're seeing a huge shock to the anti-corruption space in Brazil and everywhere in the region. And Alana, one of the areas that uh, we're seeing is kind of the, ter- the deterioration of Brazil's economic situation with huge implications for, for the media sector, right? We're seeing basically all the big Brazilian newspapers in dire straits firing reporters, especially more, more experienced reporters. Um, what is, are you afraid that investigative journalism will fall victim to the economic crisis or do you think other media outlets can kind of fill the space? And what, what is your take on that specifically? Perfect. Thank you. Just one quick comment on what my colleagues just mentioned. I'm really happy to see they're optimistic. Uh, the message that they're uh, sending to us, and and it's good to see Marcelo, for example, uh, you know, giving us an optimistic because, especially, I think. Uh, from our side, uh, from the journalist side, we've been seeing so many attacks, and there's just such a huge disinformation uh, campaigns and and information disorder, like we've been seeing. So sometimes we have the sense that it's all bad, and it's really good to see. And uh, my colleagues mentioned, you know, it's not all bad. There's like uh, positive uh, things right now, and there is uh, they're working together with uh, authority, the coffee and tax authority. So it's good to have this uh, positive side of the situation we're living right now. Going back to your question about the pandemic and the economic crisis that we've been seeing and how this affects journalism, of course, huge impact on journalism. But I think uh, at the same time that it's a huge impact on journalists uh, and news outlet, like we mentioned, there is a need uh, for uh, for information, and that in the in the other in the other hand, just trying to bring the bright side of the situation. If there is a bright side, of course, in this uh, this whole crisis, there is no uh, bright side. But uh, the confidence uh, of the society in the media went up. Especially in the legacy media, that's uh, that, that is really important for journalists. We've been seeing uh, the confidence going down. People were, you know, go, moving, moving forward to influencers, uh, to social media. They were getting information there, and they saw during the pandemic how important it is to have uh, quality information. So I think that's the good uh, that's the good uh, part when we think about the uh, journalism crisis. But Brazil has a a uh, bigger problem, not only in the big news outlet, but we have. So I was uh, getting a couple of numbers just to share with you guys. Uh, but for example, Brazil has 62% of municipalities are news desert. There's no media outlet in those places. And 18% of the Brazilian population has no access to local news. And we know, especially when we think about anti corruption uh, efforts, how important it is to have local media investigating uh, your mayor, investigating what's happening in your city, uh, in your state, in the state level. So we have a big problem. And of course, with the economic crisis, that's uh, that's uh, that's going to be even worse because of the, the main news out that they're uh, firing. There, There's a lot of layoffs, but we have the social media. Uh, and I think technology, especially right now, like we've been living all uh, through the computers and all uh, during the pandemic, I think this can be a potential revolution for journalism. And thinking about the investigative journalists, I think we're going to be, uh, we have new uh, new tools right now to investigate uh, using social media and to engage more people. I think that's, not, that's something that is important when we think about journalism and how people are looking after good information and quality information. I think we're showing how important it is and technology can be a super important tool uh, to bring uh, the society uh, to invest uh, in journalists to see the value of journalism. Trying to bring the bright side uh, and not only the the negative sides of uh, all this information disorder we're seeing. And and Gerrit, I know you've been spending a lot of time uh, thinking about COVID-19 and how it impacts uh, private sector. Um, what is your take on Brazil specific? Is there something unique to Brazil or is it just, you know, like everywhere companies are operating under duress and, and trying to, you know, 
be mindful and and have strong compliance system what is your kind of your take well let, let me first compliment alana on her um for sharing our general spirit of optimism i think it's a good thing um in the current world we live in so uh, there's always a, a positive side to, to things, and it's not all bad news. Um, the COVID-19 situation, obviously, uh, you know, and, and, and it's more, it's a global phenomenon um, in terms of its impact on fraud and corruption. Um, we're seeing it play out very strongly in the region as well, where there are increased risks of fraud and corruption. Unfortunately, we've seen many situations that here in Brazil, uh, governors under investigation, uh, obviously the state of Pará is one of them, Rio is another one where there are impeachment actions currently against the governor there. But it's not just Brazil, right? We've seen in Colombia, half the governors almost are under investigation and, and the agricultural minister, um, you know, in Bolivia, the um, uh, we, we've seen that the uh, health minister has been imprisoned. Um, and that's really because we have a huge amount of resources which have been dedicated to um, you know, government or government spending for the acquisition of ventilators, oxygen, and, and PPP equipment. And the um, uh, fact that a lot of intermediaries have been used and third parties are obviously a very high risk category generally um, with shortened or flexibilized kind of uh, procurement uh, procedures. Um, and that generally means less transparent and less competitive bids. Uh, that is not something which is going to go away. And we do think that that's, um, you know, that will obviously be a focus, I, I expect, of, of prosecutors across the region, including here in Brazil. I do think that Brazilian companies, as I mentioned, because there's a certain level of maturity um, of compliance within Brazil, uh, more so, for example, than in most of its neighbors. I would almost say all, but I don't want to be rude to every country in Latin America. So let's leave it at, at most. Um, I think many companies are better positioned here in Brazil to detect potential wrongdoing or, at least, or to prevent it, uh, preferably. Um, but it is very, very clear that the extent of the, the, the damage created is, is pretty high. And on top of that, getting back to the economic effects, um, which impact journalism, they also impact both government and they impact companies. So if we think about the economic uh, hangover from, from the pandemic, um, we might see less resources, you know, that need to be divided among many other priorities, um, you know, to get the economy back on track. You know, the fiscal deficit is obviously creeping up in many countries and Brazil is no exception. And for companies, they are under a lot of financial pressure. And, you know, one of the areas they may decide to cut, not necessarily a very smart decision, but the one area that they may decide to cut is curtail some of their investments on the compliance front and therefore um you know we, we just need to see how that plays out um but it, it doesn't come at a very good moment given that the overall trend we've seen is is slightly on the downward uh, uh slope can i can i can i make a really quick question <laughs> One of the things that I've been thinking here was a lot uh, about uh, when thinking about the private sector and thinking about journalism is this idea of what were you doing during during the pandemic? You know, what kind of value were you put in the society? What kind of actions were you doing? Do you think uh, that also has an impact? Uh, uh, thinking thinking on creative ways uh, for companies not only to to get out of the their economic crisis, but also helping society. I, I think that's a great point, um, and it's a bit of a double-edged uh, sword. So I think it's it, it would be wrong, and I think that's that's a little bit of the message which is starting to burble up. You know, demonizing com companies because they've been um, you know um, basically profiting uh, in some respect from uh, bringing equipment to Brazil and things like that. But it is an absolutely necessary part of the solution. So let's be very clear that companies have the right to do that, and they should, and they they're part of the overall value chain in its broadest sense. We have seen really encouraging signs of, of, of companies stepping up the plate um, in terms of their willingness to contribute, to donate and the like. When I say it's, a, and there, um, we've, I mean, there are multiple examples of that, um, but when I say it's a double-edged sword is because we've also seen, for example, the very same donations used in a very untoward manner to try and influence government. And that's the fine balance which needs to be struck, right? So one thing is to make sure, uh, you know, one thing is to have a noble program and objective in place. The other one is how it's executed. And that's where the controls and checks need to be in place. But you're absolutely right to signal that uh, companies have, have been, uh, you know, many companies have done remarkable things 
uh, to contribute to the solution of COVID-19. Marcelo, any views on how COVID-19 is impacting the work of prosecutors in Brazil? And, and, and besides, you, you were telling us about audiences through, through Zoom and how this changes your day-to-day -day operation. But in terms of corruption opportunities, as Geert was highlighting, we're already seeing several cases in Brazil involving governors, involving fake companies who, you know, are now procuring or allegedly have big contracts with, with uh, governments. What is your view on this situation? Mm -hmm. uh, Roberto, uh, just following up uh, what you uh, commented, uh, I, I think we, uh, we we had some some uh, change of mentality of the cooperative sector since uh, 2014. Uh, uh, companies try to detach from uh, dirty politicians and public agents. And I think that the great test of this change of mentality is uh, COVID-19. Uh, we will have more uh, loose uh, uh, public procurement procedures. We'll have more opportunities to have uh, uh, corruption acts. So uh, uh, that, that that's uh, will be uh, that that will be the, the the final or the more most decisive test. And some some companies are not complying with that. <laughs> we can tell that when we see uh, so many uh, investigations. Uh, that uh, are being executed, and some uh, uh, governance and, and some uh, issues in, in the, the uh, municipality level. Uh, one point that uh, uh, Alana uh, uh, mentioned that is very important: uh, the absence of uh, of uh, 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 transparency in in in, uh, in some some cities that doesn't have uh, any kind of, of press. Uh, Brazil uh, has uh, three three levels of, of uh, government, and we can we can uh, see very clearly that a huge difference between what happens in the federal level. We have some some criticism, criticisms uh, regarding the federal level, but uh, it's more transparent when we co compare to many other cities. So uh, it's it's a, a great issue, and when you consider that COVID nineteen will affect all the, those three levels, uh, it concerns us. We're receiving a few questions, and Marcelo, I have two questions for you, and I'm, I'm going to put them. <laughs> there are some of them. You you I don't think you love them, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> So the first question is about international collaboration uh, and asset seizure specifically. We've known, you know, uh, car wash was largely based on the exchange of information between Brazil and, and the United States, Switzerland, but also for asset seizure. Can you comment on kind of the future of, of or the trajectory that you're seeing or the, you know, the trends in, in collaboration in Brazil? The second question, which I think it's inevitable, uh, and you know, it's your view on Sergio Moro's entry into politics and the legacy of Lava Jato for prosecutors. Uh, and the charge is that at the end, Lava Jato was really an anti-PT campaign. And you have people like, and the person mentions ISC Navis specifically. We've seen, we, this is kind of a clash, a political clash that we see all the time in Brazil. I think it would be interesting to hear from you. How, how do you react to, to, to that? I, I think Hobert is disguising one of his questions in the questions he's asking you, Marcel. <laughs> <laughs> Wherein the moderator can confirm that uh, someone here from the WebEx session that, uh, that asked you that. You chose very closely the, that question, I, I see. <laughs> uh, let, let's start from from the, the easiest one, but the, the most important in my perspective that regarding the international cooperation. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, we, we developed a, a point of no return on that. Uh, we are much more closer uh, than our uh, uh, counterparts. Even in the United States, even in the UK, in the Switzerland, uh, we made an a internal study and we have more than 15 countries that were very close exchanging information through the formal channels and exchanging knowledge and how to work through the informal channels. It's something very interesting that there are a lot of criticisms regarding Lava Jato, 
because oh, you're talking to someone to make a call is not a, 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 any any kind of malpractice to to exchange emails or to exchange uh, some impressions regarding a case when you make a call. But when you're about to share evidence, to share uh, something that you have to use uh, formally, we always follow the, the, the formal channels. So there's a, such a difference. And I think we developed a, 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 a good practice on it. We are sharing with another states. And I think it's uh, all, all going to increase. I, I, I think, as I mentioned, it's a, a point of no return. Uh, regarding uh, Sergio Moro, uh, I started in, in, in Lava Jato uh, after he he left the, the office. But uh, I have the, the, the legacy. And I have a very peculiar peculiar uh, uh, thinking about it. Uh, I think it wasn't a, a good move. Uh, I think he should, he should keep being a judge. And uh, that move, I, 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 in my in my personal view, it wasn't good. And the, everything that went before the, after that uh, was uh, 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 a very 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 bad thing. I, 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 uh, the first move to to left the office was the the, the worst of all, in my perspective. And regarding the, the um, some 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 aspect regarding the, uh, if uh, uh, Labajato was uh, against any or another uh, uh, party. Uh, you just have to to, to look at uh, what we have done in, in the last two years, 2019 and, and 2020. Uh, we have no party. Uh, uh, of course, if the, the uh, executive branch of power was led by one party, it's natural that that party was more affected in the investigation. But uh, uh, everyone that we met conducing some 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 crime we were we try to, to reach free reach out so uh, I don't take it in consideration that we had some some uh, uh, partiality on it that, that was a tough question okay uh, so let me but a very good answer let me ask uh, there's one question to Alana on fake news uh, and and or the place of fake news and anti-corruption in Brazil. Um, how do you see that from the perspective of, a, of, of an investigative journalist uh, or the use of, of anti-corruption to go after people sometimes, you know, with false information? Does it undermine anti-corruption in Brazil and the rule of law? What, what is your take? Okay, good. Just putting on what Marcelo uh, just mentioned about the uh, I, I think uh, the move, uh, the movement that Sergio Moro did, it also helped this political clash and this polarization. And we know that polarization and fake news, uh, disinformation campaigns, they work together. So I think it's interesting how to understand that this phenomenon, you know, you, you, you use hate speech, you use fake news, you use polarization to clash. Uh, and that's what we've been seeing right now in Brazil. There's uh, the latest report of Reuters Institute of Journalists uh, was released last week and said that 84% of Brazilians, they don't know what to trust. They don't know what's true or what's false. And it's one of the higher numbers in, in I think, 40 countries. So I think that shows the lack of confidence of Brazilians, not only in institutions, but also in what they see. And that's that has a huge impact for uh, anti-corruption efforts uh, or in, in, in the institutions are fight, that are fighting corruption. And when you think about fake news, I think we have to understand that part of this, the narrative that uh, Bolsonaro's uh, used the, uh, during the campaign and what put him in in place uh, in in government was the anti-corruption agenda. And of course, because of the polarization that we see, there is a lot of fake news using uh, corruption as uh, as part of this this information disorder. So. It is, uh, back to your point, how do I see? I think this agenda help, helped uh, in one, in, in a, it, it just helped uh, polarize Brazil. And when you polarize, uh, we know when, when you polarize, you don't have, you're not open to dialogue, you're not open to debate. And that uh, minds not, not only the confidence of Brazilians and the Brazilian institutions, and that it's bad for the anti-corruption efforts, but also it undermines uh, public policies, you know, like because there's no conversation. 
when there's no conversation, there's no room for a debate, of course, uh, public policy, the quality of the public policy just go down. And that includes uh, anti-corruption policies. Gear, the question on investors' perspective or perceptions of, of corruption in Brazil and, and the legacy of car wash. You, you know, you work a lot with attorneys in, in the United States, in, in Europe, and investors. What did it change? Do you think Bolsonaro is reversing some of the perceptions or that Brazil was making progress? Or what is your take on that? So we work with both uh, uh, international investors and, and local investors. Um, I think there, there are a couple of common themes there. I think one of the complexities is that in Brazil currently, we have a triple crisis, as they like to say, right? The eco econ uh, economic crisis, political crisis, and a health crisis. And in a very perverse way, that is slightly drowning out the concerns around corruption. So the main concerns of investors are around those, how does this play out? But obviously, um, on the corruption front, uh, I think um, you know, investors um, were very encouraged, uh, particularly external, you know, uh, international investors, very encouraged by what they saw in Brazil over the past few years, certainly since 2014, and which subsequently, I think, also spread across the region. I think it's important to state that despite what we have uh, noted in the, uh, in the index with a drop in, in illegal capacity, that the level of enforcement in Brazil is still higher generally than other parts in, in Latin America. Again, I'll reinforce the fact that you know most companies have compliance higher on their agenda than in other parts of Latin America. And that gives a certain level of comfort. However, I think what investors are most concerned about are some of the trends. So there is, you know, Bolsonaro, like AMLO in Mexico, uh, campaigned very heavily on the anti-corruption agenda. Um, basically owned it uh, when he was put into office. To some extent, I think people thought, okay, that's done. We don't need to fight for that anymore because we now have a president who is very adamant and believes in this cause. And I think we haven't really seen that play out and that um, you know it was more rhetoric than practice. And as a result, combined with the other factors, I think that's what's keeping uh, or getting investors uh, a little nervous. And we will really have to see how this, uh, you know, how, how the developments uh, um, uh, occur now in the in the next uh, six months to a year or so. We only have a few more minutes. I, I want to go around the room with one question uh, to all of you, which is, do you think when we look at this deterioration that we saw in the CCC index, do you think this is a temporary turbulence or are you pessimistic about kind of Brazil's future in the fight against corruption? Do you think we're looking at a long-term downward trajectory or is it something that can, you know, Brazil can rebound and, and resume its progress in the fight against corruption? Let me start with Marcelo, but I'll, I'll ask also Geert and Alana to, to answer that. Uh, Roberto, it seems uh, in part unpredictable, but we have some some uh, uh, some path uh, uh, to analyze that. Is that uh, the question that we are trying to change the constitution in order to confirm the possibility to uh, have uh, uh, the, the the arrest of those one who are convicted uh, before the, the the final judgment. That, that question that we went through, it was a step back for us, of course. Uh, I think not only the change of the rule or the, or, or the constitution, but uh, the, how the debate will, will be developed uh, will indicate to us if you have some uh, con real concern and uh, uh, real advances uh, re reversing the, that uh, decrease we had in the, in the evaluation of this year. Or it's a, a, a downhill. I don't know. So mostly pessimistic. Alena, what is your take? <laughs> so hopefully yeah. <laughs> it's not a downhill and it's not a trend. I think, it, 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 of course, it depends a lot of on, on our institutions. And I think uh, uh, recently they've been... So, They've been they've been showing that they're uh, using the checks and balance system. You know that they're trying to to avoid uh, 
bigger danger, uh, bigger problems uh, for Brazil. So I think it depends a lot of our, on our institutions. We've been seeing in the Supreme Court, uh, Congress. But the problem is they send uh, mixed signals. But I think as thinking about the journalism and civil, and civil society, we have to watch really close and participate in the discussions uh, that Brazil uh, is having right now. I think empowering uh, journalism and empowering civic society uh, and, of course, our institutions it's mandatory for our democracy, and we have to keep an eye, eye it's wide open. Great, Gary, to end with you, we have two more minutes. All right, so I'll keep it very short. Um, I think I share the kind of moderate pessimism or optimism. I'm not quite sure what I detected there. <laughs> um, it's very, very clear, you know, one year in a trend, if we look back five years, we look back at six years, 2014 to today, Absolutely, Brazil is in a better place than it was six years ago. And therefore, it's normal that the pendulum swings to and fro, but hopefully it's two steps forward, one step back, and not vice versa. Um, what we have seen now is clearly a step back. And whether that step back solidifies um, will depend very much also on, uh, Alana mentioned, institutional um, performance. And we've seen evidence of that functioning a little bit better. Um, uh, of very recently, but also legislative reforms, uh, which um, you know, uh, uh, which have been put forward, um, which will help kind of codify uh, some of the some of the practices. And of course, private sector um, will need to continue to play its part. And uh, we do see uh, you know more and more commitment by companies globally, not just in Brazil, but obviously the subsidiaries here in Brazil as well, who are absolutely committed to transparent and ethical. Um, you know, working environment and business environment. And I think they can also be catalysts for change. Um, I hope, and you and I are very passionate about CCC index, um, and I hope we can speak for you as well. It, you know, um, conversations like this as well with, you know, people like Marcelo and, and Alana and, and ones we've had in other countries. I really, really hope uh, if there's anything that comes out of this is that it contributes somewhat to, you know, consolidating, you know, the positive trend that we saw over the past a uh, couple of years. So um, that's my uh, final message here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for highlighting that. The, the purpose of the CCC index is really to foster a more policy-oriented discussion, trying to find solutions to improving the rule of law in the region, in Brazil and elsewhere. So with on that positive note, let me thank all the participants here. Thank you so much for joining us, reminding everyone we, we have a last session on Peru. Um, on Tuesday, 10 a.m. East. Uh, so stay tuned. Thank you, and have stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, see you. See you later. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.